Hey, it's great to have Larry and Laura back with us. And, and I say back with us because it's good to see them, but they've never really left us because I know they've been with us online. <clears throat> I know that Laura has communicated with Missy the whole time and, and has had some good communication and has kept up with everybody. So when I say it's, it's good to have them back, it's not that they really ever left us as a congregation. <laughs> it's just we didn't get to see them because they weren't here. But it's fantastic to have you all back in person with Amen. us. It is, it is a blessing. So <clears throat> we are thankful for that. But <clears throat> if you have your Bibles and will, I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number 14. Now we know this upcoming Tuesday, and I don't know that you would really call this a <clears throat> patriotic sermon of any sorts, but it is a sermon that kind of deals with our nation, but it also deals with us individually. But <clears throat> we all know that this upcoming 4th of July on Tuesday that we're going to celebrate 247 years of independence and the freedom that was declared from <clears throat> any other nation's control of the United States of America. And we all know how that started and how that, that freedom was declared on July the 4th. But we know that that freedom was not guaranteed until 1781 when it was finally done and over with. But <clears throat> we have seen the struggles through our history and the growth of a nation that has become a world power. At one point in time, for most of... Uh, our existence anyway we were the greatest world power but in recent years we've lost that to China but <clears throat> what has happened we see that with this nation and the greatness of this nation <clears throat> I am a firm believer historically because it was proven that our nation <clears throat> has matured the way it has, became the power that it has because this nation exists because God has blessed it and because God blessed it to be an example to the rest of the world. Amen. We therefore have lost some of the powers that we've had as a nation over the past years, we have seen other nations move ahead of us in power, in strength, in money, in lots of areas. We've seen that happen because we have moved away from the reason that we even exist. Amen. Because our nation cannot survive without God and without God at the forefront. <clears throat> You know, I read a, a story one time. Max Lucado wrote a, a little analogy, and if any of y'all read Max's books, you know what I'm talking about because he uses analogies all the time. But he used this analogy one time of, a, <clears throat> of two men that were balancing a huge steel beam, and it was teetering back and forth, but because two, these two men were on each end of it, it kept it from falling. Well, they had an argument over the way that they were balancing the beam. And so they got extremely angry at one another. Well, one got so angry that he said, I'm going to kill you. And that other man said, that's fine, because if you kill me, then I'm not holding this beam, and it's going to tip over, fall on you, and kill you. So the man took out his gun shot the man across from him and therefore committed suicide because he was absolutely right. Without the other guy holding the beam, <clears throat> then it killed him also. 
And <clears throat> the comparison that he was making was that God was that balance point on that beam. And in America, we have this balance that God has always given us that keeps us balanced and right, that keeps us powerful and strong, that keeps us where we need to be as a nation. But what we've done is shoot each other, and therefore we have destroyed the balance point of this nation. It has affected us. And any time that you try to destroy the belief in God, then it is going to destroy us. Brother Dale was talking earlier about <clears throat> how he had seen so much on the news where the word of God had been challenged, that the word of God has been misused. They misquote it. They mislead people because they love to have it that way. They love to be able to say, well, this is what God said in his word by picking and choosing a sentence or a verse without comparing scripture with scripture and understanding God's full intent of what is right and what is wrong. And he's very plain. He doesn't try to hide the fact and he makes it easy for everybody to understand, just like here. <clears throat> in Proverbs 14, come all the way down to verse 34. You won't find any more simple statement than this. It says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to all people. Can you get much plainer than that? <clears throat> Righteousness exalts a, nat a nation. Being righteous, doing the right thing, and that's as simple as it is, doing what is right exalts a nation and causes it to be what it should be, blessed, doing the right thing. But sin brings reproach on all people. Doesn't matter which nation it is, sin will destroy it. I've used the example time and time again because it's what our government is built off of, okay? It's based on the political system of the Republic of Rome. So when we go back and we look at Rome's history, we see that Rome became a fantastic and mighty world power who had 10 different Caesars, and we know that all the Caesars were not the greatest people in the world, but their political system is what we base our political system on. We always continually talk about a democracy, and I'm not going to get into a political debate or whatever it is. I'm not. <clears throat> but we always talk about our nation being a democracy. Our nation is never based on true democracy. Our nation is based on being a republic. Right? And there's a huge difference when you look at it. There's not. I'm not saying that we're not a democracy. I'm not saying that we're not of that. Don't go around thinking I'm, you know, one of them crazy socialists. I'm not, okay, going that route. Okay, that's not what we're saying. What I'm saying <clears throat> is that the republic is different from a democracy. But what we find is that Rome was never truly, oh, they lost battles. They lost many battles. But they weren't defeated by other nations. They were torn apart within their own world, within their own nation. Their own nation destroyed itself <clears throat> through corruption, through conceitedness, through greediness, through lying and treachery, through control and power. They destroyed themselves and that nation fell and it started to fall apart and crumble a piece at a time and then other nations started to come in and defeat them in areas and take a little more and take a little more and take a little more 
but they didn't defeat the empire of Rome. The Roman Empire collapsed upon itself because they caused the problem. Because <clears throat> they were not built on righteousness. They were not built on doing the right things. They had the same problems that we find in the world, but especially and unfortunately that we find in America. If we continue as a nation to be a godless nation, a nation that loves pleasure, entertainment, popularity, fame, and, and continues to have a huge loss in its morality, then I promise you, because history repeats itself. And I promise you, according to the authority of the word of God, this nation will fall. And it will crumble. And it will fall apart. We in today's world, even as believers, we get too wrapped up in the political society and idea that some politician is going to solve the problems that we have in America. That the next president, whoever that may be, whoever's going to be voted in as the next president is going to come in and solve the problems that America has. And I promise you there's no one man, there's no one woman, there's no party that is going to solve the problems that we have in America today. The only one who can solve the problems that we have in America today is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only hope we have. He is the only one that we can turn to. He is what the church needs to get back to the forefront. We have become the Ephesian church in the book of Revelation chapter 2 who has forgotten what it is to truly love Jesus Christ. We have lost our love. We have become the Laodicean church that we see in Revelation chapter 3 that has become lukewarm. And the reason that they became lukewarm is because they became a the number one problem with that church. The number one problem with that church was that it became a compromising church. It started to compromise with the morals and the righteousness of God. It started to call sin things that were not sin. It started to call things that were good, bad. And things that were bad, good. So that they could continue to grow and to build and to have more money so that they could become a church that was rich, so that they could become a church that was full. From the outside, it looked like a thriving, living church. But on the inside, it was a compromising, dead church that made God sick to his stomach because it had problems, huge problems. The same problems that we see that God said was going to exist. Oh, let me show you. Go with me. I wasn't going to go here, but let's go ahead and go anyway. <clears throat> go with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Now, those of you who are learned in your Bible, you know exactly where we're going. <clears throat> now, this is the definition of what the world is going to look like in the last days, in the last time. This is a picture of the world. Now, you tell me that this is not a picture of our own nation. Forty years ago, this may not have been a picture of our nation. Today, we would look at this and we would say, that's a picture of Europe. That's a picture <laughs> of the Orient. That's a picture of somebody else. But it's not a picture of America. But when we look around today, you tell me if this is not a perfect 
picture of what America is today and the society that we live in. Let's start in verse number one, 2 Timothy chapter three, verse number one. He says, this know also. And the reason he's saying this know also, he is yelling to the top of his lungs. This is written by the apostle Paul. And he is saying, I want you to understand what I'm about to say, all right? This is important. <clears throat> and he wants you to understand what he's about to say. He says, this know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. All right. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I love the ESV version. And, and we may even go look at that because I have it here. And we may go look at that just so you can see it because it defines it so much easier. But there's one part of the ES version I don't like right here because in the, instead of perilous times, we understand perilous times, right? We know that's going to be horrible. Horrible, horrible times that are coming. Not good things, treacherous things, horrible things, terrible things. <clears throat> and the ESV describes it as there's going to be times of difficulty. It's a lot more than that. Okay? It's not about a time of difficulty. This is a perilous, horrible, terrible time that is about to come. In the last days. And you tell me this is not where we're living. We're living in these perilous, treacherous, horrible, terrible times. We are living in a time when the world is at its worst and needs the church at its best. But what the church has become is become a church that has lost its first love. It has become a church that has become compromising. It is a church that has become focused on number growth instead of spiritual growth, and we are dying. That's right. <clears throat> but look, here's what he says. All right? Perilous times shall come. Verse number two. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, Without <laughs> natural affection, truce breakers, uh, <coughs> lost my place, excuse me, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, <coughs> uh, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And what he's saying from such turn away, what he is saying is avoid those kinds of people that you see here. These are the kinds of people. Now, <clears throat> let me just go and read to you The version of the same thing <coughs> uh, from the ESV, if I can get it to pull up. And we'll start with verse number two in the ESV, because I told you the first part doesn't say perilous times. It says it's going to be times of difficulty. All right? But this defines it a lot more where you can understand it a lot better and have a better understanding of what it says. But it says, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, un <clears throat> uh, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable. Uh, <clears throat> slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good. They will be <clears throat> uh, treacherous, reckless. If I quit losing my place, we'd be all right. 
uh, <coughs> swollen with conceit, love of pleasures more than the <coughs> lo lovers of pleasures more than the lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying the power. And then it says, avoid those people. You see, <clears throat> that makes it extremely plain for us to understand the times that we are living. Now you tell me that that doesn't describe us in America today. We have become a people who have become extremely divided and continue to become divided. We have become a people who <clears throat> have not been united in a while because we have no understanding of what true unity is. <clears throat> we are a people who have become so enamored with the political systems of either Republican or Democrat that we have forgotten to focus on what God has laid out plainly before us. To follow his word the right way no matter which side that that comes down on, but to do what God says is right. Period. <clears throat> you know what we've done in this nation? We have removed the balancing point. We have removed God. We took prayer out of school. We tried to remove God from the school system. I know we still have teachers like Missy, Shante, that are still continuing to share the, the love of Jesus Christ and the gospel as much as possible. We still have principals of schools who are still trying to do things that involve Jesus Christ and the teaching of Jesus Christ. But in the majority of our schools, that doesn't happen. And then we wonder why we have school shootings while we have all of these problems with our youth, because we have taken the authority away from the teacher to be able to control their classrooms. <clears throat> we wonder what the problem was. You know where the problem began? We removed God from school. So essentially what we did is we took God away from our children. And you say, well, I don't want them to teach my children religion. I want them to teach my kids how to read and write. I'll teach my kids what I want them to know at home. Okay, I'll give you that. Knock yourself out. But the problem is, is we're not teaching our children about Jesus Christ at home. You know why? Because we have removed God from our homes. God is not the most important part of your household anymore. Everything else becomes more important. Our job becomes more important. Our schedule becomes more important. Things become more important. And we remove God. Our children do not see us study the word of God. They do not see us pray. They do not hear us read the word of God together and teach the word of God to our children. Our children don't know the simplest Bible stories that they can be. You know that my wife had, <clears throat> what you have, 20-something kids in second grade or whatever it was. 20-something right, kids in second grade. You know how many went to church? Two. Two. You see what I'm saying? This is what we have become. This is who we have become. And our nation is falling apart. Our nation is full of the same people that we read about. Because we have failed God. Because our nation has turned its back upon God. Every time you remove God from something, Satan replaces him. And then we wonder why that went wrong. Oh, I wonder why this doesn't work. I wonder, this was a fantastic idea <clears throat> that everybody's going to come together and love everybody and everything's going to be fine and wonderful. That's what God wants. Absolutely, that's what God wants. But God has a way, one way, and there's only one way that that's ever going to happen. 
And that's through Jesus Christ. Amen. There is no other way. There is no other plan. There is nothing else that is going to, uh, to make it work. Right? <clears throat> so I don't care whose theory, I don't care whose idea, I don't care whose political view may think that it's going to solve problems. There's only one problem solver. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There's only one hope that we have in life. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you see, every time we remove God, we create greater problems in our nation. Every time we remove God from something, it creates more and we promote more things that are wrong. Now, you know I'm very outspoken <coughs> about legalism and legalistic ideas all right drives me bananas because we do not live under the law we live under grace legalism will destroy what people's view of christianity all right <clears throat> there was a does anybody know that mark twain Samuel Clemens, I don't talk about this a lot, but we all like Mark Twain's books. You know, everybody likes Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn. But you know, he was an extremely, extremely vocal atheist. Horrible atheist. And one of the comments that he said, he said, I don't like Christians. Because if Jesus Christ himself walked upon this earth, the one thing he would not be is a Christian. You know why he made that comment? Because we are filled with hypocrites. The church today is filled with hypocrites. The church today is filled with people who do not practice what we preach. We do not do the things that we ourselves say are right. The church went around for years and held on to legalistic ideas. Okay? Now, I'm all about reverencing God. Don't misunderstand me. Do you know how many, how many years, how many years did we hear? You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. If you do this, you're going to hell. How many years did you hear in your life? If you had a tattoo, you was going to hell. Okay, the old way. <clears throat> and you say, well, it's a new way. No, Jesus Christ created that way years ago. It's grace. It's not legalistic idea. Right? People who talk about tattoos or men who have long hair or women who have short hair or women who wear pantsuits to church or women who wear dresses to church or people who do this or people who do that. How many times have you heard those things in your life? and their legalism, and their wrong. <clears throat> and it doesn't matter whether you agree with me or not, I can take you and go scripture by scripture and show you through the word of God where you don't live under those legalistic ideas. You Amen. don't live by law. You are saved by grace. Amen. And that's how we live. All right? Now, does that destroy God love us, our Baptist traditional ways? Almost. But it does not affect the idea that those legalistic ideas are leading us in the wrong direction. And we hang on to them, and we hang on to them, and it's killing our church. It's killing the body of Christ. It's killing the church that we know in local congregations and the church as a whole because people are still trying to ride a fence instead of finding the point where God said, this is where I separated you. This is what made you holy. This is what separated you apart. And it was what Jesus Christ did through the cross and through his resurrection. That's what set you apart. You see, <clears throat> we have become a people who have become these people. We have become a compromising church because we don't want to upset people. And well, God loves everyone. Absolutely. That's not a lie. 
God loves everyone. He loves everyone enough that he gave his own son so that everyone could be saved. But God hates sin. God doesn't hate sinners. God hates sin. And when you continue to sin and go against God, God can't bless what is wrong. God will not bless sinful acts. God will not bless sinful people. That's the word of God. That's not my idea. It's not your idea. That's God's way. And that's the way it works. God will not bless a nation that continues to sin, that accepts sinful things. As a matter of fact, you go into the end of the book of Romans, chapter number one, and you find that he holds those of us who accept those sinful acts even at a higher plane than he does the ones who create or commit the, sin, the sinful act. We're held even more responsible because we accept it and let it be so. Now that's God's word. That's not my opinion. That's what God said. <clears throat> but yet we become more and more compromising all the time because we have forgotten the whole purpose that we were even saved by God's grace. We forget the whole reason that we even take breath. We forget the reason that we live, and that's for Jesus Christ. Because of what he did, not because of what you can do or you have accomplished or ever will accomplish, but because what he's accomplished in you. Do you know how we fix the problem? Do you know how we get rid of all these problems that we have? <clears throat> Number one, you and I as a church has to be at its best. When the world's at its worst, we have to be at its best. We have to be the opposite of the people that we read here. We have to be people that you can depend on, people who are faithful, people who are going to love and care for others and help others and do the things that are right in the eyes of God and stand up and do what you know is right. Keep your hearts pure. Do you know how you do that? They can't stop us. It doesn't matter what society says, doesn't matter what government says, doesn't matter what people say. Paul was very plain. You remember in the writings of Paul, especially in the book of Romans, because <clears throat> they were struggling with following. You got to remember when the book of Romans was written, Nero was the Caesar, okay? And even Roman believers were having a, a trouble following the things of Nero. So Paul reminded us the same thing that applies today. You always follow the laws that are set forth for you as a society. That's your responsibility. You follow the laws set forth for you by society. If there's a speed limit posted out there, there's a reason. If there is a reason that you don't, you know, <coughs> steal stuff from the store, there's a reason. Now, of course, that's covered in the Ten Commandments. But there are civil laws for a purpose. Paul says, obey the civil laws unless, and he brings this out, unless they contradict and go against the word of God. Then those are not laws for you to follow. Civil or otherwise. Do not fall into the foolishness of society and accept things that God says are wrong. Because when you do, you have just become a Pharisee. You have just become a religious hypocrite. You have not followed the things of God. How hypocritical have we been in our lives? If you want to change America, if you want to change the course of America, then we have to keep our hearts pure. They can't stop us from living our lives the right way. No matter what they do, they can't stop us from living the right way. They can't stop you from living the gospel of Jesus Christ. They can't stop you from being different than the world. 
Those are adjustments we make. We choose not to live our lives the right way. We choose not to live by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We choose not to live different from the world and to fit into every one of these categories <coughs> that God so boldly told us, avoid those people. Turn away from those people. Stay away from those people. Sometimes you have to make sacrifices in life. Oh, they're my friends. They're my family. They're part of this. They're part of that. If they're wrong, <clears throat> they're wrong. And I'm not saying we turn our back on people that we can help and lead to Christ. Don't ever misunderstand me because I'm very vocal about 2 Corinthians 4.3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. You share the gospel, but you cannot support and enable things that go against God. Because when we do, we become right at the front of the line of the biggest hypocrites in the world. We have to set it aside. We have to let our voices be heard. Do you know that a couple of years ago, and I still remember this, and it always comes to my mind kind of at the end of school every year. It always comes back to my mind. <laughs> because there was a young lady that just earlier in that year, their football coach had been fired because he was getting um, the, the football team together and was saying the Lord's Prayer before a football game. And, and, and uh, <clears throat> so some of the parents complained. The ACLU, Lord love them, came in and caused problems and said they were going to sue the, the school board. And <clears throat> anyway... The, the, the football coach kept doing it. So the school board fired him. So there were over 4,000 people in attendance. And there was young, one young lady <coughs> who had nothing to do with the football coach, didn't have a brother on the football team, didn't play football, didn't have anything to do with anything. She was just a young Christian girl who attended school. So she went to the principal before the graduation <coughs> And she asked him if at some point in time during the graduation that she could just speak for 30 seconds to have a reflection of her time in school. The principal granted her that and said, sure you can. So she got up and for her 30 seconds, she got 4,000 people. 4,000 people that were in attendance at that graduation to all say the Lord's Prayer because that was her 30 second reflection. They weren't going to keep her silent. Just because they fired the football coach, she had no fear of consequences of what was going to happen to her. She simply just started saying the Lord's Prayer. And when she started, 4,000 people started saying it with her. Because she wasn't afraid to let her voice be heard. She wasn't afraid to share the truth. In today's world, we're scared to death to speak up and speak out about Jesus Christ. I understand we don't have the opportunities that we used to. We don't live in the same world of visitations that we did 25 years ago. It just doesn't exist in today's world. Okay? <clears throat> we understand that. We know that. Used to, you could go visit people, talk to people. You could go into that. If you do that now, you're probably going to get shot, shot at, get a dog sick on you, whatever. People don't trust you, okay? And it's because this is the world that we're living in. We're living in perilous times. So even good people are not trusting people. You understand? This is the times that we're living in. And we have to wake up and see. But the reason that we're living in these times is because we have removed God from our nation. That's why America's in the state that it's in. That's why we are so divided. That's why we are not the United States of America anymore. We are the divided state of America. <coughs> because of what we have become. Because of what we have done. So how do we fix it? Pray. All right? Now I'm all about <coughs> revival. Uh, 
But, but just simple revival. And here's where a lot of preachers, and there's a lot of preachers, Lord, there's a lot of Baptist preachers, throw rocks at me if they heard me say it. <clears throat> but there's a lot of times where we spend too much time trying to revive the Christian all right, instead of trying to change the world. We, we are failing miserably. We spend so much time on the, the focus of our nation needs revival. Does it? Absolutely. Absolutely. But our nation needs more than a little light to flow into it. It needs more than just a little bit of unction to get up and do. <clears throat> How many revivals have you been to in your life? Uh, used to when I was a little boy. We had a spring revival and a fall revival. You remember it? Right? You Baptists, you know what I'm talking about. Everybody does. Right? We, got, we got spring revivals, fall revivals. You had one every year. It didn't matter if you needed it or not. That's the way it worked. It was tradition. We had revivals. Because springtime, you need to get revived so you'd be all right from now to fall. Then fall time, <coughs> you had to have something get you through the winter. Right, so we have a week-long revival. Well, during that week-long revival, even if it went a little further, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, we'd have a revival. So during the revival, people get on fire for God. You've seen it. People get filled with the Spirit. You'd have Paul Baptist that ain't even woke up for service starting to hoot and holler. Right? They'd get excited. And most of them had slept through 30% of the services before. All right, some of you now, I can come by and yell and wake up. <laughs> no? So <clears throat> that's what I'm saying. It's the way it was. But during the revival, you see people get excited. And we get excited. We say, oh, God's moving. God's moving. You know why? Because God was moving. But you know what happens? The revival's over. You know what happens three days after the revival's over? you right back where you was. How good did that revival work? Worked good for a week. Worked good for a week and five days. All right, worked good for two weeks. Worked good for three weeks. But then all of a sudden, we got to have another one in the fall because the one in the spring didn't do enough. It's not just about getting that little spiritual life back in you, that little spiritual light back in you. To get revival to stick, to get revival to work, there has to be change. And to get the change to come, that takes repentance. You know what repentance means? Everybody says, oh, you know, we've got to be, repent and be baptized. No, what I'm talking about is turn around. You've got to change directions. You've got to do something completely different for it to work. Right? <clears throat> Revival won't work without change. Change won't take effect <clears throat> if you don't know what you're doing it for. You see, so we pray, we pray for that revival to come. That's good. We know that revival can change God's judgment. We all remember Jonah, Jonah and the whale, right? And how the whale swallowed Jonah because he ran. But what was the whole point? <clears throat> God was sending him to Nineveh. And he didn't want to go. It was a Gentile city and he was a Jew and he said, I'm not going over there. Well, we all know the story about Jonah. But then what we forget, we all remember the story of Jonah was in the whale's belly for three days. And it was a whale because Jesus Christ himself calls it a whale in the book of Matthew. Right. So <clears throat> when we think about it, <clears throat> we look at this and we see that he went to Nineveh and he preached and he said, if you don't change, God's going to destroy you. Oh, and when he got there, he, oh, he was a fiery Hellfire preacher when he got there. I promise you. Son, I'm sure when old Jonah preached to the to those people at Nineveh, they could feel the flames of hell touching their hind end. I'm sure they felt it. 
Because he was saying, if you don't change, God will destroy Nineveh. Guess what happened? They changed. Nineveh changed. And God spared his judgment. And what happened to Jonah? Jonah got mad. <clears throat> He's like, I didn't get to see it. I didn't get to be it. I came and I preached my heart out that they were going to be destroyed and they didn't get destroyed. Why? I said, because they did what I asked them. They did what I asked them. You remember Mary when she came to Jesus? It's just a little extra tidbit. <clears throat> but when she came to Jesus and they were at the wedding feast and he turns the water into wine and Mary comes to Jesus and she says, we're running out of wine. And Jesus said, that ain't my problem. And so she says, well, we've got to fix it. And so he said, okay, we'll, we'll fix it. So she goes over to the servants, the people who were serving the wine, and she goes and gets them and she takes them to Jesus and she gives some of the greatest advice that we will ever receive in our lives or that we will ever get from anybody. And it came from Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know what she said? Do you remember? Here's what she said. Whatever he tells you, you do it. Whatever he says, you do it. Greatest advice you're ever going to receive. Whatever Jesus Christ tells you, you do it. It's that simple. <clears throat> we use all the time when we talk about revival. How many times have you heard the Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14? Right? Everybody can quote it, right? <clears throat> but if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and do what? Pray and seek my face. Did you hear what he said? Humble yourselves, pray, seek God, his will, his purpose. He said, then, then, when you do that, when you do what you're supposed to, he said, then, will I hear from heaven? I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. That's the only hope that we have for America now because we're already in the perilous time. People always say, <clears throat> where is America in prophecy? Let me tell you where we are in prophecy. Let me tell you where we fit in. Nowhere. We're not there. We're one of those nations that is followed in line with every other nation in the world that is following an antichrist. That's where we fit in. That's who we are. Now, is that who we want to go ahead and become now because that's our destiny? Or do we want to see our nation change? And become better. Amen. God allows this nation to remain in existence because he chose it to be a believing example to the world. And we, we have abandoned that. God has not abandoned us. We have abandoned God. We are trying to remove him. We are trying to twist his words. We are trying to destroy our own nation. We are those two people who have an argument and shoot each other and kill each other and we're perishing if we don't get back on the right road. And it starts with you and me. You say, how am I going to make a difference in the entire United States? I just told you how. God told you how. It's easy. You just got to start. It starts with you living your life the right way. 
and let God take care of the rest. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your glorious word. God, we thank you that you allow us to live in the nation that we live in. God, that we have the freedoms to stand and preach your word. That we have the freedoms to tell the truth. That we have the freedoms, God, to go out and do the things that we do in this world. God, we are thankful that you have granted these to us. But Lord, we pray that you put this nation on the road to change, that we start to put God back where he belongs, in the forefront of our government, in the forefront of our schools, in the forefront of our homes, in the forefront of our minds. God, that he is what this nation truly focuses on, is living for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and accomplishing his will and purpose. God, we know that you can do this. We know that you, you have the power to accomplish these things. And we pray that you will give us the strength and the courage to live our lives the right way so that we can ever accomplish your will. In Jesus' name, amen.